Um, first off, before I even start speaking, I just want to say thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here. Um, I was nominated by my professor, Regina Galasso. Um, I'm taking a translation course with her right now. She's a professor at UMass Amherst. And um, again, it's just an honor. People have spoken already, and I've heard some incredible stories, learned some stuff, and also identify with a lot of their experiences. Um, but yeah, so this is, I guess, a speech about what language means to me. Um, one of my first moments looking back on everything was, I remember one day my mother was driving through some sort of strip mall parking lot, right? And she was talking about something going on, and um, I didn't really listen to what she was saying. I, I didn't really want to understand what she was saying. I didn't want to really think about what she was giving for advice. And I remember just thinking about Chinese for some reason. I don't know why, but thinking about how a person that speaks Chinese would not even understand what my mother was saying. And so this was the first moment where I was like, whoa, English isn't the only thing on this planet. Um, and I know almost nothing about how people communicate in the world. Again, I was six. I don't really remember, probably six around there. But um, I just remember being like, wow, need to learn some languages. Um, as a toddler, my parents say that I was really silent for a kid my age. and. Um, they said I was, yeah, unusually quiet and that I wasn't talking a lot. And so I actually had to go to speech pathology appointments um, for not being able to pronounce the L sound in English, which to this day, I don't like it just because I'm like, ugh. But anyways, um, I would usually just replace it with the W sound. And so after these speech pathology appointments, I was able to get the muscles in my tongue to kind of strengthen my, my phonological muscles and whatnot. And I overcame those obstacles. I began speaking, and now my parents weren't worried about you know what when I would start talking, but rather when I would stop talking. I think I asked way too many questions as a kid, um, and I'm sorry for that, but that's just what it is. The next foundational moment in my life um, came in seventh grade in Spanish class, and it was public school Spanish, you know, pretty basic knowledge. Um, but I remember just seeing these cool combinations of letters. The same letters I knew in English, but now they were being represented in new ways and new and conveying new meaning. So I just remember loving that class. I did really well in it too, um, and I just yeah remember just really falling in love with the language of Spanish. Um, fast forward to high school, I placed into kind of the advanced um, Spanish 2A at the time, and I was really excited about that, but um, I was going into a private school and I was a new student, so I was kind of shy, I was awkward. And um, that Spanish class like, was really tough for me. Um, I didn't have friends, and now all of a sudden, as we know when we're learning language, we sound like fools when we start out trying to say all these new words and whatnot. So yeah, I was freaking out, you know, I wasn't getting as good grades in the Spanish class as I thought I would. and. Um, Eventually, I started to get the capacity to really start contributing, commenting. I know one panelist said before that just producing a sound is so important when you're trying to learn a language. Um, so three years later in Spanish class, it's my junior year in high school, um, my parents and I, although we didn't intentionally or originally plan it, we ended up hosting um, a Spanish exchange student named Fernando. And he was from Bonferrada, Spain, which is in the Northwest. Um, we became like brothers, oftentimes we fought, but like that was just, you know, brothers being brothers, friends being friends. Um, and he taught me a lot of things, not only about language and culture, just I guess about life, about people of the world, about the otherness, right? The otherness that sometimes we're not shown, we're not given. Um, to end my high school career, um, I, our senior project was you could choose to go to Greece, you could choose to go to China, I believe. Um, I was lucky enough to go to Cusco, Peru for two weeks. And there I worked on a chakra, which is the Quechua word for farm. Um, and I also spent, yeah, again, I spent a lot of time in Cusco, but we also kind of traveled inland to the sacred, sacred valley of the Andes. Um, and there we and this picture right here is on the Camino de Inca, which is, I guess, the, the route that you take to go to Machu Picchu. Um, so I didn't only see just beautiful, obviously the landscape is breathtaking, 
but I got exposed to a new type of otherness. Um, again, my Spanish, my Spanish tool set had allowed me to get to that point, but I was also exposed to Quechua, which is an indigenous language spoken today by you know, a lot of people in terms of indigenous languages go. Um, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, they all speak variations of it. Um, and so at that moment I was like, okay, I know Spanish and yet I still can't understand these people. So this is kind of an underlying theme that I've noticed in myself. I just want to understand the sounds of others. Um, I've also, I took a lot of classes in college uh, about languages. Um, I've taken Italian, Swedish, Quechua, um, Chatino, which is a language I'll be talking about in a minute, um, Portuguese as well, Catalan. So I really just like getting a wide range of, I guess, hearing the sounds of the world, right? Um, and I was lucky enough, in 2014, my professor invited me to do research on an indigenous language called Chatino in Oaxaca, Mexico, which is on the southwest coast. And um, Oaxaca is known for its diverse indigenous population with a lot of different groups. Um, and again, I was working with the Chatino people in the mountains. And that was also kind of similar to Quechua. Um, once again, at these, I thought I knew Spanish. I thought I'd be all set. But I really didn't understand anything that the locals were saying. Um, and in this field research project, we pretty much hiked every day to plot sacred ceremonial sites. Um, to record plants used for medicine by the, by the natives. And that was awesome. Again, beautiful sites everywhere. This is still Peru. Um, but that trip was awesome. Um, but I still wanted to do more, I guess. I wanted to go to another place. Um, in May of last year, I was getting tired of the schoolwork that had been driving me into the ground. And I'm sure we can all relate to that as students. Um, and I, I felt like I needed to take a step in a new direction. Um, or in the case of me, a million steps in a western direction because I walked across Spain from the border of France all along the coast to Santiago de Compostela on the Camino de Santiago. Um, yeah, you walk a lot. <laughs> and I walked about 20 miles a day or so. Um, and you know, it's just beautiful. You're just strolling through a country, and that's a really cool feeling, but at the same time, it gives you a new perspective on, I guess, how a nation is built. Um, you go into cities, you leave the cities, you go through small towns, and you meet incredible people, not only the locals. Um, on that trip, I met people from England, Switzerland, Germany, France, <laughs> um, Italy, Ireland, South Korea, everywhere, really met people from all walks of life. And if you could tell, I love taking language courses. So this variety is something I think that fit me well, meeting all these different types of people with new perspectives. Um, one day I walked 17 miles um, just to find out there's no bed for in the albergue, which are the hostels along the way. Um, there was no bed, so I just walked another 15 miles. And that day was exhausting, but uh, it was one of those days that really I guess, I don't know, I, it just stuck with me, right? Um, as I kind of go ahead and look at my future, um, you know, after the Camino, I was able to take a step back and really realize what I wanted to do. Um, I know I have to work with languages. I like helping people. And so recently, I've been taking a lot of translation courses and in interpreting. Um, I'll be getting my medical interpreting certificate soon at the end of the semester if everything goes right. And um, translation is something I want to pursue because all the sounds I've you know, received in my life, I've absorbed and I've learned, I've listened. Um, and translation gives me a tool to kind of produce and, and help people out in the world um, to make the strains familiar, which is, I believe, the job of translators, right? Um, I just want to, again, say thank you um, for everyone watching online, also everyone here. And good luck to the future presenters. The past presenters were awesome. Um, I also wanted to thank my parents who are sitting right there. Um, if it wasn't for their support, obviously, I, I wouldn't be here today. I know it's a cliche, but it is true. And uh, they've done a lot for me. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for listening. And on to the next one.